Welcome to On Scene with the Firestorm. I'm Peter Kay. Joining me today is Tom Reagan, president of Shelby Specialty Gloves. Tom is a recognized expert in structural fire gloves, so he's got quite a resume. Tom, I'm going to read from it because it's it's so impressive. Tom, you're a member of the technical committee for NFPA 1971. You're a board member for the International Hand Protection Association, a board member for the International Glove Association. You're the inventor of two fire glove patents with two more pending. You're a contributing author to the Leather Facts Handbook, and you're an, an inductee in the International Glove Association Hall of Fame. You're a Hall of Famer. Thank you. I think it's safe to say you are probably the Roger Fire Gloves. Would that be fair? Well, thanks for the compliments, Peter. And thanks for having me here. Um, I spent the better part of uh, 30 years in the glove business, and I've learned a lot about firefighters' gloves. Some things that you you learn over years that you just can't learn um, instantly. Our glove factory uh, uh, in USA has been continually producing gloves since 1953, and there's not many glove companies left in the United States that can make that statement. My goal here today is to help educate you about firefighters' gloves so that you can make the best decisions about hand protection. And you know, we've learned over the years that finding the right balance between dexterity and protection is the key to finding the right glove. So I guess tomorrow, if you know more about hand protection for first responders, than you did today, then maybe I did my job. Great. Let's learn about our hands first. Yeah, we get a lot of questions online about gloves, and, and typically the, the number one question is, how do I find a glove that's gonna fit my hand? Well, the first thing we have to do is learn about our hands, because I believe when God created our hands, that it's a pretty incredible invention. And you know, I, if, if you notice your fingers, all of your fingers stagger when your hands are like this. So I could actually take anybody's hand and trace it on a, on a piece of paper and cut that out and sew a glove just like I traced it with the staggered fingers. Other than a seam allowance that would be required when making the glove, when I slid that glove on that person's hand, it would fit just like what we traced. But look what happens when your staggered fingers become not so staggered when you when you clench in a clinch in a fist clenching motion. Mm -hmm. So what would happen on that glove that I liner I had traced, that glove would actually back off your hand and it wouldn't fit right. So there's a lot of things that go into making gloves that aren't so simple. For example, um, we pointed out that each of your fingers are staggered, yet they become unstaggered when you make a fist. Notice too that your finger crotches lay at an angle, they're kind of webbed. That's something that's kind of new into this firefighter hand protection and is something that Shelby as a company is working on replicating in gloves. But if you also notice your fingers tips are rounded, okay? They were rounded for a reason. And you also notice on top of those fingertips that you have fingernails. And if you've ever busted your fingernail with a hammer and you lose your nail, you know that that finger kind of feels like a nub. And you, and, you, and you lose the ability to be able to pinch and pick up small objects and to turn things. So the purpose of your fingernail is to lay on the top part of your finger and it applies pressure to, to your finger so that it helps your fingers to be able to pinch and pick up so that your fingers can kind of have a tweezer effect. Someday we'll be doing that same technology in gloves. We're making some small steps in that direction now. So folks, stick with me here. This is really, really interesting stuff. If you want to learn about how your hands and how glove fit actually relate back um, to the way that the gloves function on your hands. So first, let's start by learning from the inside out. You know, over the years, you learn about firefighter turnouts, and you learn about things like materials, you learn about fit, and you learn about protection. And there's a lot of resources spent, both from the fire department and the manufacturers and the salespeople and the distributors involved to make the, these, these evaluations for turnouts so that they end up getting 
the turnout that is the best protection for them. They look at all the materials from the inside out. And that's what we're going to do today in gloves. So I have to kind of ask the question, if you're going to do wear tests on turnouts, don't you think that you, if you're going to wear test gloves, that you should also know what's on the inside out? Do, and doing the same type of evaluation that you would do your turnouts. Because, you know, sometimes in gloves, since you can't openly see what's inside of each glove. Sometimes it's what you can't see that matters most in a glove. Because we all know that in turnouts, you can see the different layers. And that's what I'm going to show you today is each layer in a glove and why we use the materials that we use. So let's start by looking at the most economical linings and barrier systems. There's several things that you can do. You can use inserts like this that are polyurethane. Mm -hmm. What we use is a is a uh, an RT seventy one hundred that's cut and sewn and seam sealed, and every single liner that we make is dump tested at our factory before it ever leaves our factory. Mm -hmm. So we dump test a hundred percent of these to make sure that they're liquid proof. So I said we were going to look at economical linings and economical barriers. Today in the fire service, these are the options that you have in that category. You have different types of polyurethane where you have this type of RT7100 system. RT is a PTFE, RT7100 is a PTFE that's made by W.L. Gore, which is probably the leader in barrier technologies in the world today. So we partner ourselves with, with Gore to use RT7100 and their PTFE barriers. Mm -hmm. Now, you would to keep comparing, this ends up looking like this. Mm -hmm. These are materials that we acquired and made, made to show, replicate the different types of lining systems that are used. Or you can use this one. So this would turn in to this. Mm -hmm. In our system, this is what we use. Now, I wanted to be able to show the durability of these materials because if you think about it, what element of the firefighter's PPE probably receives the most use and abuse? Got to be the gloves. It's got to be the gloves, or maybe the soles of the boots, but the gloves are certainly up there. Mm -hmm. So my point is to be able to show how certain barriers have more durability than other barriers. And one way to show that is to show thermal stability. So now I'm going to compare thermal stability of polyurethane barriers versus PTFE barriers. Now, these, these weren't tested in full gloves. Mm -hmm. What I did is I took each barrier system and I pinched them in the back like this. Mm -hmm. And I hung them in an oven at a temperature between 275 and 300 degrees hung them in an oven, all three of these systems, mm -hmm. including the Shelby system. Yep. And at the end of about 60 seconds, this system ended up looking like this. Okay, so the, bar the barrier began to degrade, mm -hmm. and it actually dripped in the oven. Mm -hmm. I'm simply trying to point out that PTFE barriers have greater thermal stability than polyurethane barriers. And that all relates back to durability of gloves that are used in the fire service. Let's get a shot of the back that you can see what to the, the fingers there. It really did melt into form as so we started to come apart there. Okay, and this other polyurethane barrier that was in the same environment, it actually lasted about 15 seconds longer. Mm -hmm. And this is what you got. So again, I'm just trying to point out that polyurethane is not as durable for thermal stability as a PTFE barrier. And how did the how did the Shelby system turn out? Here's the glove that was pinched in the back and put into an oven and you can see it came out looking very similar to the way that it went in and we actually kept this in for two minutes. Okay. At what temperature again? Between 275 and 300 degrees. Sometimes what you will see too is that the thermal linings will actually begin to draw up before maybe the barrier will in some cases. Mm -hmm. 
So again, I'm trying to point out that in the one element of PPE that probably sees the most abuse, sometimes it can have materials inside of it that are the least durable. And you can't so, even see them. And you can't see them. Okay. We also make other barrier systems. If you go up into a more higher grade system, like with the Crosstech film technology, in this system, we put this in our more premium line of gloves. It has a Kevlar and lensing thermal liner. We've also applied to the back of the hand that uh, this is, these are called thermal protection zones and all the compression points on the backs of the fingers and the back of the hand. And actually, where this thermal protection zone material, which is a three layer material that's applied directly to the barrier, it will actually boost the TPP value by at least 50%, which is pretty amazing because what we've learned over the years, especially in turnouts, is you increase TPP thermal protection by adding layers and typically those layers are a little thicker. So we've been able to accomplish the same thing by, by putting on this thermal protection zone material and not having to thin up our outer shell materials to improve dexterity while growing thermal protection. Okay, another thing to remember is in these type of systems, well, you got to wonder what's holding the thermal liners inside of these inserts. And in most cases, it's a heat activated glue, um, a, a thermal type glue which really doesn't make sense that you would use a heat activated glue in a firefighting glove. So I'm sure that most of the people that are watching this today have at some point in their career or their fire departments have learned about liner pull out. And you know that when a liner pulls out trying to get the fingers back in the right finger holes on the inside of a glove that you can't take apart is pretty frustrating. Mm -hmm. So what we were able to do again with this, this, this system and this system is we have an attachment mechanism where we apply the material to the backs of the fingers and add an attachment tab. Now, just to show you how Shelby as a company has continued to make small steps to improve our finger tactility and the, the fingers um, ability um, to turn knobs and so that your fingers on your hands go to the ends of the gloves much better. I'll give you an example. This is what we produced for many years. This is your, your Gore RT7100, your PTFE thermally stable barrier. It's laminated to an SEF monacrylic fleece. It's cut and sewn, seam sealed, and whether it's a lady's extra small, we cut and sew and make an extra small liner mm -hmm. so that it fits the lady's hand better. If it's a man's jumbo, then we cut a jumbo size. But our attachment mechanism has remained pretty consistent. We apply this to the tips of the fingers and you can see the stitch line. But what this did while we completely eliminated the possibility of liner pullouts in a Shelby glove, there was this much space in the tips of the fingers. Right. And you can put on a lot of fire gloves and pinch the tips of the fingers and you can feel that dead space in the tips of the fingers, which kind of kind of impair your ability to pinch and pick up things. Right. So what did we do different? If you will notice these stitch lines lay about a, between a quarter of an inch and maybe at the most a half inch off the tip of the finger. Mm -hmm. We eliminated this with a new attachment mechanism that we do that is actually patent pending where we, we use the same concept, but if you notice the stitch line, it actually lays at the tip of the finger so that the fingers on the glove with the fingers inside of that can actually go up to the ends of the outer shell. So we have eliminated, or mostly eliminated, mm -hmm. that dead space in the tips of the fingers. There will always be some seam allowance for the, the outer shells and the tips of the fingers. But this attachment mechanism was made, was made so that actually when it lays on the back of the finger and curves down like you would in the back of a glove, mm -hmm. the stitch line lays right at the tip of the finger. That's pretty slick. So you got the best of both worlds. You've got a secure inner liner, liner that's not going to pull out, and you got maximum dexterity. Absolutely. Now, I don't want to come across in any way that we have the perfect glove. We are constantly trying to make improvements. We have excellent products, but we're also listening to the fire service and making changes to the things that they want to see improved without going backwards in protection. 
this is this is good information. I just want to pause for a second and, and let everybody know that as soon as this broadcast is done, it'll be available on our YouTube channel, so you can watch it back. If you want to send it to a buddy to see, they can watch it. Also, if you've got any questions while we're going along, go ahead and type them into the QA box. And if we have time, we'll get to them. If not, we'll post answers on our Google Plus page. Or if you want to email us, Tom, where can they email you with questions? They can email me at tragan, R-A-G-A-N, at shelbyglove.com. Or they can always visit our website at shelbyglove.com. We're, we're happy to answer questions. And we, we get um, emails all the time from people out in the field. You know, We've talked about durability, and I've made this point because do you know that in firefighter turnouts today, there is no polyurethane. There's no polyurethane in any compliant NFPA turnout, and it's for good reason, Peter, because several years ago when there was polyurethane used in firefighter turnouts, mm -hmm. there was some issues of durability that, that were in the field, and so those issues were brought to different um, different organizations in the fire service, which decided, well, we don't want to discriminate against any materials, so we'll create test criteria that will test for durability, and if you meet the testing, fine, then you can be used in firefighter turnouts. If you don't, then it's not deemed durable enough to be used in turnouts. And the, like I said, today, there's no polyurethane used in any NFPA compliant turnouts. So did you hear what I just said there? There's no polyurethane in turnouts. So that kind of begs the question, well, if it's not durable enough for your body, right. then why on earth would it be durable enough for the one element of PPE that, that we probably determined receives the most abuse yep. and use, mm -hmm. which would be your gloves. And that's why Shelby made the decision years ago not to use polyurethane, but to use a thermally stable PTFE barrier, just like what's used in your turnouts. Makes sense. Okay, moving forward, let's talk about now, let's learn from the outside in, since we've learned about from the inside out. Listen carefully as we learn about outer shells. And remember things like thermal protection, like flexibility and durability. And since most all gloves have some leather on them, let's start with leather. And when you're talking about leather, there's some things that you need to know. Leather will shrink when it's heated, and leather will stretch when it's soaking wet. And there's two ways to combat that. One is by adding chromium to the leather. The other is with leather thickness. Now, when, the le when, when this leather comes off of the animal, whether it be a cow or an elk, um, this leather is very dry. And dry leather tends to rot really quickly. So you add softeners and, and powders and things called fat liquors and different materials that will soften up the leather and make it much more flexible. To fire glove leather, you add chromium to the leather because chromium is metal. Right. It's added to the tannage process so that when you heat it, the metal absorbs the heat mm -hmm. and not the protein in the leather. Because when you have fire gloves that start getting brittle and stiff, that's because the protein, and protein is like an egg. Right. And we know that when we cook an egg on the stove, that the more you cook it, it gets, it gets harder and harder and harder. That's the same thing that's happening to protein in leather. Mm -hmm. The more it's exposed to heat exposures, the stiffer it gets, the harder the glove is to flex, the more it wants to shrink. So that's that's the two ways that you can combat shrinkage in leather. One is by adding chromium, but it's not as simple as just adding a ton of chromium and using real thin leather because you remember chromium is metal right. and chromium chrome will absorb the heat and retain the heat. So you might run into a situation where once you leave the heat source, your gloves continue to stay hot of what's known of stored energy. Mm -hmm. So there's a balance there too. The other one, the way to combat it is with leather thickness. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to show you now is I'm going to demonstrate how leather thickness is directly related to leather shrinkage in heat. Now, these will be pieces of leather that are all cut from the same 
same size die. Okay. They're all the same size to begin with. Mm -hmm. And there are four different thicknesses of leather. And what you will see is that the more exposures to heat, the more the leather begins to shrink based on how thin it is. Mm -hmm. These are all the leathers that were, were um, that are pristine. Okay, and this leather right here is 3.75 ounce to 4 ounce grain elk skin. Mm -hmm. This is three and a half to 3.75 ounce split cowhide. This is two to two and a quarter ounce goat skin, and this is um, one and a quarter to one and a half ounce goat skin. And you can see that they're all the same size. That's what we started out with in this little test. So the leather thickness is a function of the animal it comes from? Yes, it can be. Okay. On certain animals, because the leather is so thick, mm -hmm. the leather um, can be split into several different layers. Mm -hmm. At Shelby, we in the elk skin, mm -hmm. we use the outer surface of the elk because why elk is the, is the softest, um, the softest leather used in fire gloves. We need to use a thicker material to so that the leather will last longer. It doesn't abrade as quick. And we have found that by using the outer surface of the elk, that relays the longest wear in gloves. It also is the most expensive mm -hmm. of, the, of the leathers. And in split cowhide, we used a select number one split, which means it's the first layer beneath the outer surface of the cow. Mm -hmm. Because most of the outer surface, the grain leather of the cow, is used in the apparel business where they're willing to pay a whole lot more money for mm -hmm. it. So these are all pristine. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to show you after one exposure of between 275 and 300 degrees. Let's go this other way. For about three minutes. And you can see how, as the leather got thinner, it shrunk. So these are pieces of leather. And I'm not saying that an overall glove is going to shrink that great. Right. Because there's other things involved. It may be that the leather may be stitched to different pieces of material. Mm -hmm. But what I am trying to point out is that leather thickness is directly related to shrinkage. Mm -hmm. And we know that fire gloves aren't used in one fire, one hot fire, and then thrown away. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, fire farmers can't afford to do that. Right. So gloves are continually used in hot fires. Mm -hmm. So I did a second exposure. So you can continue to see where I took the material. So now you can see how, how the shrinkage just continues to, to, to continue to shrink. Now, Tom, in now, this one, there's only three. Right. Is there a reason for that? Because I felt like in in this one here mm -hmm. that it showed that the leather was so thin mm -hmm. that it had already shrunken so much that it probably wouldn't continue to fit a hand properly. Okay. So I didn't even do a second test on the thinnest leather. So the thinnest leather shrunk so much that it became almost undescribable. Right. It shrinks up kind of like bacon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, again, these are pieces of leather, and they're only to replicate. Mm -hmm. um, the thickness of leather and shrinkage. Gotcha. All right. So we all know that your gloves are exposed to numerous fire exposures. They're not a one and, and one and done kind of heat exposure. Right. So wouldn't you agree that glove shrinkage relates back to fit because we know that they get stiff and the stiffer the glove, the harder to flex. It relates to dexterity and it also relates to protection because air layers in gloves relay thermal protection. Mm -hmm. And when gloves shrink to where all the air layers or most of the air layers have been squished out, then you have a glove that is minus an important layer of protection. Right. So what's the leather thickness in your gloves? Here we are again talking about durability or durability concerns mm -hmm. in the one element of PPE that probably sees the most abuse. Mm -hmm. So finally, let's look at some gloves. These are our most popular gloves. These, these, uh, this, this is our cowhide glove, our Shelby FDP. It's been around for a long time. It has a tremendous track record. We make the same thing with a cowhide back, but with a pigskin palm. Mm -hmm. And we move these leathers around from back to palm 
based on durability. We know that pigskin is the most durable leather we use. And we know that our cowhide, whether it be the blue koala or the gold koala, and that's just a, a tanning process that our company uses when we have our leather tan, um, because it's tan like a golf glove, I mean, it, which means it can get wet and dry softer longer. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that, that, that these fire gloves will never get stiff, because like I said, when you remove the hide from the animal, you have to add softeners to it. Well, those softeners tend to come away from the leather. And when that happens, then your leather starts stiffening up. The only difference is, is in pigskin. When pigskin comes right off of pig, it tends to be, um, have more oils, more natural oils from the pig itself. So pigskin will stay softer longer and has a tendency to, to, to need to be broken in. Mm -hmm. So right out of the box, pigskin may be slightly more stiff than cowhide and cowhide might be slightly more stiff than elk skin, but elk skin would be the least durable. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason you use a little bit thicker layer of elk. So we have cowhide and pig skin. We also have elk skin and pig skin. These are our Shelby FDP line. And in Shelby FDP, you have the Gore RT7100 seam sealed liner system in all of these gloves. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a lady's extra small or a man's jumbo, the liner's cut and sewn to fit that outer shell. And we know that we got liner attachments so that you won't have liner pull out. And then we also, our softest um, Shelby FDP glove is all elk skin, where the outer shell on the back is grain elk, and actually the palm side is grain elk too. We've just turned the grain side in. Mm -hmm. But remember what I said earlier, we use the grain elk outer surface of this animal because it's the most durable layer. Mm -hmm. It may cost a little more, but it's the most durable layer for elk skin. So other liner systems, and, and uh, the other liner system we have is the Crosstech Film Technology. It is a grade up system, okay? It has a Kevlar and lensing thermal liner. It has the thermal protection zones on the backs of the fingers, in the pressure point areas, across the knuckles, that relays a higher level of thermal protection. We use this system in a basic cowhide, okay? The gold koala cowhide, the like that's used in the other products. We also use it in a cowhide that has a Kevlar simplex material on the back of the hand. And Peter, beneath this Kevlar simplex, let me show you what is there. Because it's some really cool stuff. This is black Kevlar simplex, mm -hmm. which is a highly cut resistant, 100% Kevlar material. It stretches, so it helps with the flex on the back of the hand of a glove. But beneath that, the next layer, the next layer you would see is, it's called Rochelle. Mm -hmm. This thermal lining is the same thermal lining that's used in a lot of the automotive racing suits for the, the guys that race cars on TV on Saturdays and Sundays. It's pretty neat. It's lightweight. It's kind of spongy and flexible. The outer surface on it is Kevlar. If you look at the inside, there's Nomex fibers. And then on the other side of it is Kevlar again. So we have a glove here, the Shelby Model 5285, has Kevlar on the back of, back of the hand on the outer surface. Right. Beneath it, there's a layer of Kevlar. Mm -hmm. Beneath that is a layer of Nomex. And beneath that is another layer of Kevlar. And then next to the skin is also another layer of Kevlar and lensing. Yeah, that's thorough. So that's, that's our second glove that's used in, uh, that, that has the Crosstech film technology. Mm -hmm. And then finally, a direction that as a company we've been trying to go is to a more form-fitting glove. We know that when our hand is at rest, your hand is curved. It has a pre-curve to it. And that's what we're trying to replicate here with our three-dimensional or multi-dimensional glove. Mm -hmm. This glove has the Crosstech film technology with the thermal protection points. And notice how what we've done here is we've engineered every finger on this glove to be a little different than the one next to it. We have, a, we have an index finger, we call that a trigger finger. It has a top and a bottom, it's two dimensional. Mm -hmm. It's shaped very much like our finger is. It tapers as compared to a finger that doesn't taper. You can see the difference. Mm -hmm. So we have a trigger finger, it's tapered, this glove has four sheets, which, which means there's panels in between the fingers. 
We know that the finger crotches lay at an angle. Mm -hmm. Okay? Just like we talked about earlier in something we're trying to replicate on our hands. Mm -hmm. Okay? <clears throat> we also notice that the middle finger actually has four pieces. It has a top, a side, an underside, and an inside. So it has four pieces of material that come to a point in the middle. That's called a four-point pinched finger construction, which is very hard to manufacture. But the wonderful people in our factory do a fabulous job at it. They get better at it every single day. And this is kind of a direction that we're tending to go in a multi-dimensional glove. When you do a multi-dimensional glove, you notice how the palm lays in the palm of your hand? Yeah. It lays there. It doesn't blouse out so much. Mm -hmm. Because we know that when you get materials in here that blouse out, when you're grabbing a hold of pipe poles or you're grabbing a hold of axe handles, that, that, that makes you have to use your own grip strength more because the glove's working against you. Well, when you use your own grip strength more, it fatigues your hands quicker. So we're improving hand fatigue with this multidimensional pattern that does not allow the palm to blouse out as much. It has a half keystone thumb. Notice how that lays in your palm and your thumb well. And another really cool aspect of this glove is it has what's called Shelby G-Block. And G-Block is a wrist blocking system that holds the glove in place on your hands so that you will have a secure grip over time, even after. Because we know whether we're doing yard work at home, we're in work gloves, we're constantly having to reset the gloves. And we also know that if you're doing firefighting, you're constantly having to reset the gloves. Because what's happening is gloves are creeping, kind of working their way off your hand. Right. Well, what G-Block does, it's 360 degrees of, of sheared elastic, but the top side of the glove shearing is offset from the underside based on the anatomical bone bones in your hand and your wrist. So it's like blocking or locking it on your wrist. It's called Shelby G-Block. And we put this also in all of our gloves that have the Crosstech mm -hmm. film technology. Another thing that, that this glove has is an AeroShield grip piece. Since we're unique and the only company today that has a true trigger finger, and I can promise you that the trigger finger that we'll produce next year will be a better trigger finger than we produce this year. Like I mentioned earlier, we're constantly trying to work on things to relay better fit and function mm -hmm. to our customers. Burst shield in here so that it helps grip things, helps gripping pipe poles and axe handles. Mm -hmm. We can make an entire palm out of that because we know that these materials don't always grip the best in wet conditions and dry conditions. So we have a mixture of materials on the palm that will allow improved grip. So let's be clear about a couple of some things, everything that I've shown you today. Every glove I've shown you today is made right here in USA. It's made in our factory. So I would ask you, where are your gloves made? And if you want to know where your gloves are made, all you have to do is look at the label and read the front and back of all the labels, and it will tell you where your glove is made. Unfortunately, a, a popular sales approach today is to play off what you can't see. Some will show a thin, soft, cushy glove, and they'll, they'll throw it on the fire chair chief's desk and they'll say this glove has a real real high TPP and it carries an NFPA label too. Try it on and see how you like how it fits, how, how it feels. But remember folks, sometimes it's what you can't see that matters most. It's not a one and done TPP score. We don't wear gloves into one hot fire and throw them away and get a new pair. We continue to wear them. So what I'm showing you from Shelby are gloves that will continue to relay both thermal and liquid protection in our gloves, even after hot exposures. You know, sometimes it's not, it's not the, the, the second fire or the third fire or the fourth hot fire that tells what a glove's made of. And so you want to make sure that your, your gloves continually relay high levels of protection, no matter how long you've been wearing them in hot fires. 
So let me ask you, what have you learned today? Are your gloves like your turnouts and continue to relay protection? Do the gloves that you wear today, has anyone come in and taken them apart and shown you every single layer? Because I would challenge each of you to cut open whatever gloves you're wearing today and look for yourself and see what levels of protection are in your gloves. And you want something that will continually relay protection. You want to be able to do the same evaluations for your gloves, which we know now are probably the most um, one item of, of PPE, the one element of the ensemble that receives the most abuse and the most use. So do you better understand the balance between dexterity and protection? Hopefully you did learn something and that Shelby Specialty Gloves is a valuable and credible resource for firefighters hand protection. Thank you for watching. Thank you so much, Tom. We have all of Shelby's gloves on our homepage. You can get to them a couple of different ways. We have a banner in the middle of the homepage that says gloves, or if you're navigating from the top nav bar, select PPE and then select, select gloves. If you have any follow-up questions, feel free to post them on our Google Plus page or our Facebook page or email Tom directly. Thanks so much for watching. Thank you.